Thank you, choir, Gigi. Wonderful. Wow. We are so blessed. What a good reminder this month. Our scripture lesson this morning comes from Amos chapter 5. I'll be reading verses 14 through 15, but also let me just remind you to go home today and read Amos. It won't take you that long, I promise. I wouldn't tell you to do it if I didn't think it was uh, important. Uh, it's a... Uh, it's a lament, uh, a call to repentance. And um, uh, Amos is uh, declaring what God has told him. He, he is reminding the people that we need to humble our hearts before Almighty God and, 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 and get our hearts back to a place where we are surrendered and, and we are obedient to the things that God is calling us to be and do. Chapter 5, verse 14. Seek good, not evil, that you may live. Then the Lord God Almighty will be with you just as you say He is. Hate evil, love good, maintain justice in the courts. Perhaps the Lord God Almighty will have mercy on the remnant of Joseph. May God bless the reading and the hearing of His Word this morning. Now, you may be wondering why we are in the book of Amos. Uh, it's a, a different kind of book, uh, and uh, we are talking about true worship today. And, and I think the prophet Amos does a, a very good job of helping us to direct our hearts, direct our minds, direct our lives to a place where we can truly be a, a worshipful people and worship God in, in the sense that he wants us to to worship him. And it was during this time in the nation of Israel that they had strayed from true worship. They were going through all the motions, but their hearts were far from God. God was ready to pass judgment on Israel, and the only thing that was going to keep Israel uh, from receiving this judgment was to seek God. And that's what the Bible tells us to do, right? We are, we are to seek God daily. And when we seek Him, we shall find Him. And that's what Amos is trying to help the people of Israel to, to, to stop doing what you're doing and start seeking God so that you can be in a, a better relationship with Him. Now these locations that are mentioned in, in Amos chapter 5, Bethel, Gilgal, and Beersheba, were places associated with great privilege and, and they had a, a spiritual heritage about them. Now Bethel is, is where God met Jacob. You remember the ladder where the angels are ascending and descending between heaven and earth? And then Gilgal, that, that's where Joshua and the people of Israel uh, made an encampment after they crossed the River Jordan. And, and, and what happened was the, the people, their adversaries, started hearing about what God had been doing in the life of His people, and they became concerned. And as the Israelites sat down and began to eat the fruit from the promised land, the manna stopped. And they continued to move into the promised land. And then Beersheba was a place where God met Abraham, and, and Isaac and Jacob, and he reminded all three of them that I am with you. No matter what's going on in your life, no matter what's happening, I will be with you. But these places that were spiritually important to the people of Israel at one time had become places of vain and empty worship. Israel was clinging to its routine. We get in a routine sometimes, don't we? And we're just going through the motions. Really involved, we're not really active, you know, except for just being there, and we're not really, you know, listening to what's happening. I was thinking about that this week, and I began to think about the times that I was in church at Mulder and Craig Carter was preaching, and he'd be on point one. The next thing I know, he's on point three. It happens to the best of us, you know, we kind of phase out, we're not really listening to what God is trying to say to us. And so Israel was clinging to this routine. They did not exalt God. They did not repent of their sins. And they did not have the love and compassion that marked them as God's people. 
So let me ask you a question this morning. Have you ever considered what does God really think of our worship service? What does God think of the way we worship Him? If God critiqued our worship service, what do you think He would say? Would He like it? Would He come back? Would He be blessed by our praise? And I'm not talking about is it traditional or is it contemporary or is it a blended service. What I'm asking, is God being honored? Is this true worship? Is it transformational? Is it changing our lives? And are we encountering the living God in worship? Too many times we come to church wondering what I will get out of the service. Will the music be good? I hope they play my favorite songs. Will the preaching be good? I hope he don't go too long. <laughs> Will we get out on time? Will we beat the rest of the Christians to the restaurants this morning? Will somebody speak to me? I know there are people sitting in this congregation this morning that are here because they went to another church somewhere and no one spoke to them. You've shared that with me. I can't imagine someone coming to worship here and somebody not speaking to them. But sometimes we get hung up on, our, on ourselves. So instead of coming to church focused on ourselves, we should focus on giving God the praise that is due Him, the honor and the glory that is due Him. The psalmist writes, Enter His gates with thanksgiving and His courts with praise. Give thanks to Him and praise His name. We need to lift high the name of Jesus in worship. We need to be praising Him and thanking Him for all that He is to us. Worship is about proclaiming the worth of the Lord. True worship occurs when we exalt God and are humbled by our sin. Exalting God and humbled by our sin because we know that sin separates us from God. The prophet Amos knew this and he pointed it out to his contemporaries in Israel and in Judah. And the people who showed up at the synagogue, at the church, weren't really worshiping. They were just going through the motions. They were playing church. When I was a senior in high school, my dad was a pastor at Demopolis first. And I remember one Sunday he preached this sermon. It was called Playing Church. That was the title of his sermon. And I think he was talking to me and all the rest of the seniors that day. Because that's what we were doing. We were just showing up, just playing church. That's not how God wants us to come to church. He wants us to come to church and, and, and be convicted by what we hear and be changed by what we hear and be transformed by what we hear. But in Israel, there was no conviction. The worship that the people were given were not, was not acceptable to God. And God used some very strong language to describe His displeasure. And, and these are frightening words. He says, I hate, I despise your religious feast. I cannot stand your assemblies. I will not accept your offerings. I will have no regard for them. Away with the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your harps. God wasn't interested in the order of worship or the melodious song they were singing or even the amount of their offering. God wanted to see justice roll like the river. That's what Amos is saying. And righteousness like a, a mighty, never-ending stream. He wanted to see surrendered and obedient people. He wanted to see thanksgiving and praise coming from the hearts and the mouths of His people. But what God saw instead was widespread oppression and immorality. The, the people had rejected the law of the Lord. They disobeyed God's Word. That's a slippery slope when we start disobeying God's Word. And they worshiped idols. And that word is, we're disconnected from that word idol, aren't we? It doesn't mean the same thing to us as it meant to people years, you know, thousands of years ago. But let me remind you that anything that has a higher priority than God in your life is an idol. It could be success, it could be affluence, it could be materialism, it could even be popularity. All these things can be idols. 
And the people of Israel took advantage of the righteous and, and the poor for their own personal gain. This was the leadership of the church. They deprived the poor of justice. They oppressed the innocent. And they took even more taxes from the people. And they practiced sexual immorality. In our time, we have, have allowed the world to rewrite the moral code for our society. Instead of the word telling us right from wrong, we have allowed the world to tell us right from wrong. And when the church starts following the world, we are off course. The world needs to be following the church. That's why the Bible says that we need to flee from sexual immorality. See, the actions of the Israelites made it impossible for God to accept their worship. That, that's why Amos said, I mean, why God told Amos, I will set a plumb line and, and I will spare the people no longer. And if we continue to act like these people, God will not accept our worship. Now don't think for a minute that you can act any old way you want to Monday through Saturday and God will accept your worship on Sunday. Don't fool yourself or think that God doesn't care because God does care how you live your life Monday through Saturday. And He especially cares how you live your life on Sunday because that's the day of rest. That's the Sabbath. That's when we should be devoting ourselves to God all day long. So what does God say in Amos? Let me remind you. Seek good, not evil, that you may live. Hate evil, love good, and maintain justice. In other words, seek the Lord and live. You can't live an unrighteous life during the week and expect God to accept your worship on Sunday. You can't take advantage of your neighbor on Monday, cheat on a business deal on Tuesday, tell a bunch of lies on Wednesday, cheat on your spouse on Thursday, have a fight with your friend on Friday, get drunk on Saturday, and then expect God to accept your worship on Sunday. Our worship service, and I've said this before, needs to be the high point of our worship all week long. Every day we need to be worshiping God. When we offer God our true worship, we are inviting Him to inspect our hearts and, and, and remove anything that is not of Him, that is not like Him. And this is the promise of true worship. We will be transformed into the likeness of His Son, Jesus. Because God will reveal the truth about the condition of our hearts as we worship Him and He will give us the opportunity to change and allow Him to change us. See, as we humble ourselves before Almighty God, He cleanses us from all unrighteousness. That's what the Bible tells us. That when we come together, when we fellowship together, when we worship together, the blood of Christ cleanses us from all unrighteousness. He forgives our sin and frees us up to truly worship Him. And only people who act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with God can truly worship God. A person's worship comes directly from their life, so how we live our life Monday through Saturday, how much we praise God and worship Him throughout the week, will affect how we worship Him and praise Him and magnify and glorify His name on Sunday. What does the Bible say? Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. A person's worship comes directly from their heart, from their life. And only a surrendered life of obedience can bring acceptable worship to God. He demands righteousness before ritual, but it's not our righteousness. In fact, Paul reminds us, our righteousness is like filthy rags. What we need to be clothed in is the righteousness of Christ Jesus. When we worship God with true love and complete su submission, God will come and commune with us. That's the promise that He will be there with us through it all. The promise is not that we will feel better necessarily or our heavy burden will be lifted, but that God will come and be present in our life he doesn't always end the storm, but He is always in the storm. He's there for us. Even when we're going through difficulty, He's there for us. He's in the storm with us. And we need to be reminded today that the storms don't last always. 
God comes to us in our response to our worship. And the psalmist declares, let all creation rejoice before the Lord, for He comes. He comes to judge the earth. Uh Uh-oh. He will judge the world in righteousness and the people in His truth. Yes, He comes to us, but He comes to help us to change our ways, to help us be transformed. And Amos reminds us that on the day of the Lord, some... It will be like fleeing from the lion and running into a bear. I read that in in, in Amos this week and I started thinking about that. Can you imagine? Lion starts chasing you and you're running and you get around the corner and you do, man, you've lost the lion. The lion don't know where you are. And then all of a sudden, boom, there's the bear. You're fleeing from a lion and you run into a bear. Then he says, you will run into your house. That's a safe haven, right? Our house is where we're supposed to go and it's safe for us. But he says, you will run into your house and a serpent will bite you. For those far from God, the day of the Lord will be a terrible day of gnashing of teeth and and darkness. And and see, outwardly, the people of Israel were fulfilling everything that Moses had taught them. And by going through the motions, Israel thought they merited God's favor and deserved God's blessing but their hearts were far from God. And they were not experiencing the power and the presence of God in their life. And when God looked at their worship, He saw no humility, He saw no repentance, and He saw no obedience. They were just going through the motions. Israel had, had, what had happened in Israel is they had mixed other religious services into their service of the one true God. They had mixed the religious practices of other nations into their worship. And outwardly, Israel appeared to worship the one true God. But in reality, they were worshiping foreign gods. And they profaned God's holy name. They looked good on the outside, but they were dead on the inside. God looks at the heart. He wants to see true love and complete surrender and obedience to Him. When we worship God with sincerity of heart, God will meet us in worship. He will commune with us in in worship. But God did not see this in Israel. So here's my question for today. What does God see in our worship here? Are we just going through the motions? Or does God see humility, repentance, and, and obedience? Does he see that we have returned to the heart of worship? Matt Redman's song, Heart of Worship, gets to the heart of worship. He writes, you search much deeper within through the way things appear. You're looking into my heart and I'm coming back to the heart of worship. And it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it. When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. And and what God expresses in verse 25 of this chapter is the fact that Israel did not bring him acceptable sacrifices and and offerings. God says, yeah, you brought me sacrifices and offerings for 40 years in the desert, but they were not acceptable. They failed to worship God from the heart. And Jesus, talking to a group of Pharisees one afternoon, said this, you're the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of others, but God knows your hearts. And God is looking at our hearts this morning. So what does God value in worship? How how do we understand that? Well, James helped. He's helpful. He says, humble yourselves in the sight of God and He will lift you up. Our worship to God needs to be a humble and reverent act. And, And Jesus said, but the hour is coming and now is when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. What does that mean? That we have to be connected to the Holy Spirit and trust the Word of God. That's why Jesus said, your Word is truth. And Paul said, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And as we work out our salvation with awe and wonder of the God who created the universe and everything in it, our worship will be more pleasing to God. And again, Paul says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. 
Our minds are renewed as we meditate on God's Word and as we worship Him. And then we need to bring acceptable offerings and sacrifices to worship. And the one that is acceptable is the sacrifice of praise. The Bible reminds us that the Lord inhabits the praise of His people. You want God to show up in worship? You want God to show up at your home when you're praising Him? That's what you do. You praise Him and then He inhabits the praise of His people. If you want God to show up in, in worship, praise His holy name. And the Bible reminds us that, that we need to praise Him each and every day. What happens when we praise God? Praise magnifies God. Praise puts our focus on God and not on our problems. Praise humbles us. Praise defeats our, our pride and our ego. Praise reveals our, our devotion to God. If I love Christ, then I will praise Him. <coughs> and praise also motivates us to holy living. Praise opens our hearts to live the way that God desires. And praise increases our joy. Joy is, is the constant companion of praise. And praise establishes our faith. The greater we see God, the smaller our obstacles will appear. If you want to see a difference in your relationship with Christ, then praise Him in worship. Praise Him when you go home. Praise Him before you go to bed. Praise Him when you get up in the morning. Praise Him at work. Praise Him at lunch. Praise Him all day long. Praise Him even when you don't feel like praising Him. Or when you feel like giving up, praise Him. Commit your life to a, a life of praise. And you will experience the fullness of Jesus Christ and the joy that He brings. That's why we worship the Lord. Because see, true worship connects us to God and with each other. And true worship energizes us for ministry. And true worship is practiced for eternity. You know, when we go to heaven, what are we going to do? We're going to worship the Lord. We're going to praise His name. We're going to give Him the glory and the honor He deserves. We're not going to be sitting around and looking around and thinking, whatever. We're going to be worshiping God. So this is practice for eternity when we come to church and when we worship Him throughout the week. Then truly His righteousness will flow like a, a mighty river like a never-ending stream, and our worship will be acceptable to God. This morning, maybe you need to reconnect to God or come back to the heart of worship. And I know this for a fact, God is waiting on you this morning. And the altar is open. The altar is a place where grace can be applied to your life. You may get some good food at our place, but you're going to get some grace at the grace place. And really that's what we need. We need grace in our life. We need God to, to intervene in our life and to help us to come to a place where we can truly worship Him. And I pray today that you will begin to see a difference in your relationship with Jesus as you praise Him every day. And let your praise next Sunday be the high point of your praise this week. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for helping us to understand how important praise is in our life with you. As we serve you, as we, Lord, surrender our life to you, we know that our praise brings your presence and your power into our life. So, Lord, when we're feeling weak, when we feel like we can't go on, when we feel like giving up, when we feel like the whole world is against us, remind us, Lord, this week to praise you. And we pray all this in Jesus' holy name. Amen.